we are going to be talking about another module of principles and parameters framework of linguistic theory, which is independently called binding theory. Okay. Now, just a small note on this terminology. The whole approach of principles and parameters in natural language is also known as the approach called government and binding theory. Okay. Uh, these are the different names for similar types of uh, uh, similar types of explanatory tools of natural language. So, if, if, if someone asks you the differences between principles and parameters approach of looking at natural language and, the, and uh, that of uh, government and binding, the answer is none. Okay, they, are the, they are the same thing. However, these terms independently mean different things. Principles mean something else, parameters mean something else, government means something else and binding means something else that I am going to show you today. So, we, while looking at uh, linguistic theory, we have been looking at several things. We know, in, first we looked at empirical facts of language. Uh, in terms of its uh, structure at the level of sounds, words and sentences, we started looking at that. And then we started looking at what is it that we call principles of language, parameters of language and what is it that the whole approach called principles and parameters in natural language that does in terms of explaining abstract phenomena underlying language. In other words, abstract rules underlying language. And finally, how does it really work? Where, what, what do we mean when we say uh, human mind has a great role to play in learning of language? It is a unique phenomenon. We do not know how we end up speaking so much that we speak. We do not know how everybody speaks the same way in one language, within a language or beyond boundaries of languages. So, we, we looked at uh, several things, we barely touched a couple of issues while talking about differences between I language and E languages about E language, uh, because larger chunk of what we ought to discuss in this course uh, within the framework of this course was related to I language. Therefore, we are still sticking with how I language works and what is it that uh, a particular linguistic theory provides us with to understand natural language. And in, in continuation of that, we are going to be uh, looking at binding theory. Okay? What is it that we call a binding theory? Okay? Uh, it, the, like I have been telling you all the time, names are names. Uh, names mean anything only in the context, like we have discussed about words too, that they are arbitrary. They, they acquire meaning when we provide the meaning. They do not mean anything by themselves. Okay? There is no reason why something should be called that thing. Okay? So, same, same thing applies here. However, let us look at what we mean by binding, binding theory. We begin with uh, looking at some examples. Okay? Even before we look at example, just a sentence about binding theory, it is about interpretation of noun phrases. Okay? In a sentence, that is within a sentence and the reason why we are saying within a sentence is because the minimum unit of discussion, the minimum unit for evaluation of anything or explanation of any sort of syntactic type is coming from a sentence. That is, a sentence is a minimal unit of a study for uh, understanding I language, for understanding structure of language. Therefore, uh, when we say interpretation of noun phrases, we mean interpretation of noun phrases within a sentence. Okay? So, we are, we are going to look at, look at them and if now before we look at 
more of that in details. Let us look at some of these sentences. Uh, stars in the beginning of these sentences represent their ungrammaticality. That means the, senten the, the starred sentences are not grammatical according to the intuitive judgments of native speakers or for that matter this much intuition even we have as non-native speakers of English that these sentences are not good. Right? So, uh, what, are, what are these sentences and uh, I, I have also put some of the things with colors for us to see so, so that we can, we, we can understand the, the things that we are referring to in the sense that what are the things that we are talking about when we say interpretation of noun phrases. So, we have a first sentence, John saw himself. Right? In this sentence, there are two parts. One is John, the other is himself. Uh, assuming that we know about the grammatical relations, where one is the subject, the other is the object. Okay? If we look at the grammatical category, that is the, the category of a lexical item, John is a noun phrase. Right? And so is himself. Right? How, by, by the way, we are talking about this kind of a phrase for the first time in, the, in this class. What is the meaning of himself? And if it is a noun phrase, we are giving it a broader term, which, calls, which is called noun phrase. Right? But what type of thing is this? It is somewhere very close to a, a pronoun. Right? Because we have seen something similar of that sort, which is, let us look at the next sentence, John saw him. Right? So, do you see any similarity between him and himself? Similarity between them. Right? There, is, there is some sort of similarity between them. Right? However, there is a difference too. And the difference between the two leads the second sentence to ungrammaticality. However, independently the second sentence is not ungrammatical. You see, you, you, you see the point, In, independently the second sentence is not ungrammatical and these things have meanings in terms of grammaticality of or ungrammaticality of a sentence given the interpretations of noun phrases. Okay? So, uh, let, let us move, move little bit slow in order to understand this thing. Not that we are trying to understand the sentence, we are trying to understand a phenomena. Uh, so, there is a similarity between him and himself. Him is a pronoun, right? Therefore, we can say himself is also something like a pronoun. Therefore, it qualifies to be a noun phrase. All right? However, him is a canonical true pronoun and we are not that sure about himself. It looks like a pronominal element, but not that sure about, sure about it. Now, a, a word about ungrammaticality of the second sentence. I said, and you agree with that, that independently the sentence is not ungrammatical, right? But this sentence is marked ungrammatical here. Can you tell me a little bit why this sentence, under which circumstances this sentence sounds ungrammatical and under which circumstances this is all right? We, we know this thing, right? So, can, can somebody quickly tell me in two sentences? The, the, the sentence John saw him, right, is ungrammatical if we mean John by him, right? If him stands for someone else in the discourse, then it is all right. Okay? This, this sounds trivial. But hang on, we'll come back to that. It has something to talk about the interpretations of noun phrases. That is to say, in the first sentence, there is a relationship between John and himself. In the second sentence, there may be or may not be. If we try to establish a relationship between John and him, then the sentence is bad. And if we leave them independent, then there is nothing wrong with it sentence. Right? So, that is that's the part we need to keep in mind. Third one, John thinks that Mary likes him. Right? Sentence is good. 
right. Now, it has independent noun phrases like John, Mary and then it has a pronoun him. Who does this pronoun him refer to? Clearly John, right, clearly. And now comparing with the first sentence, sorry, sorry, I, I don't have numbers here but I am sure you can follow, comparing with the previous sentence that is John saw him, the third sentence is good. In the second sentence, him could not be associated with John, therefore the sentence is ungrammatical. But in the third sentence, it is okay to associate him with John. Do you, do you see the point? And the sentence is completely all right. So the, this, this must have some, there must be something going on here, right? right? All right, we will come back to that story in a moment. In the next sentence, John thinks that Mary likes himself is bad. Right? This is, this sentence is not grammatical, not just because of Mary and himself, okay? not just because of that. However, that is true. If we say John thinks that Mary likes herself, then the sentence is good. But keep in, keep in mind, even if we put, let us say we put Peter in place of Mary in that sentence the sentence is good, right? John thinks that Peter likes himself. Now, in that case, I do not have that sentence here, therefore I am just telling you, in that case, however, himself has something to do with Peter, not with John. See this thing? In that context, my point is, in, look at the previous sentence again. Him can refer back to John in the previous sentence, but himself cannot refer back to John in the, in the sentence that we are talking about. Get, get my point? All right. Then last two sentences, John thinks that he is a genius. Sentence is good, right? Now who does he refer to in this sentence? It could be John. Could it be anyone else also? Yes. Can be anyone else also, right? So comfortably we can say this sentence could be ambiguous, could have at least two different meanings, right? Very nice. Now, how does two different meaning come from? We, we do not want to go into the details of semantics, but just as a note here, how does the ambiguity pop up? Ambiguity comes in by the interpretation of the pronoun he, right? If we interpret it independently, then it has a different meaning, the, then the sentence has, an, has a different meaning. If we interpret this pronoun with reference to John, then it has a different meaning, right? Get it? All right. Finally, John thinks that himself is a genius, is not a good sentence. Right? which is to say that himself in order to refer to John, there seems to be some problem. Now look at the first sentence, John saw himself is perfectly all right. But when we say John thinks that himself is genius, is not a good sentence. In other words, there is no problem establishing some sort of relationship between John and himself in the first sentence. However, in the last sentence, it is not really possible to establish that connection between John and himself. These are very simple sentences. I hope I have given you in simple terms the interpretation of these, these elements in color which you know as noun phrases and pronouns and nouns and stuff like them. Right? And the ambiguity that comes out of them, the reasons why these, the sentences that are marked with stars may be ungrammatical, right? We, however, what we need to understand, what we mean by interpretation of noun phrases in syntactic terms is the following. What, what allows reference between John and himself in sentence one? and what stops reference between 
himself and John in the last sentence. Right? What is the problem if the pronoun him refers to John in the second sentence? Right? These are the, 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 uh, the theoretical points that we need to discuss with the apparatus that we have seen so far, uh, which are at least uh, phrases, I am sorry, uh, x bar is key, right? And then we will see, does existing apparatus give us explanation to these things? And are those explanations convincing enough? All right? So that's the that's the purpose, and that's how we look at binding theory. So the terms like himself, herself, itself are called. These are reflexives. These terms are called reflexives. They are called reflexives or reflexive pronouns because they reflect back to something. In a sentence, for these kinds of pronominal elements to appear like himself, herself, itself, themselves, right? they need to co-refer to some other elements in the sentence. Okay? They need to co-refer to something else in the sentence. In other words, they need to depend on something else for their interpretations. Therefore, these are called reflexives or reflexive pronouns. Okay? Now, here I have put the term anaphors. Okay? Anaphors is a theoretical term in government and binding in principles and parameters, which means reflexives and reciprocals together. Do you understand when I say the term reciprocals? Sorry? Back to itself. That's, that's right. Recipro no. Back to itself is reflexive. Reciprocals are terms like each other. Okay? If we say something, John and Mary like each other. The term each other is called a reciprocal term which refers back to John and Mary. When we say John and Mary like, like itself, the sentence is no good because itself is a reflexive right? and it needs something called like a reciprocal. So, the, the elements like reflexives and reciprocals both together are called anaphors. Okay? However, like always, I give you this freedom that these terms are not that important. What is important is phenomena. Okay? He, she, her, his, it, these are simple pronouns. There is a typo. His is not, uh, uh, italics has got no meaning. Okay? Uh, it is just a typo. Okay. The, the terms like John, Mary, computer, classroom, students, the, these terms which are, which are like nouns, they are called R expressions. We, we can still call them nouns, we are not changing anything. That I, I only want you to know they are called R expressions because they are, uh, R expressions mean referential expressions. Okay? They also receive their interpretations in sentences. Uh, when, when we use a sentence, when we use noun phrases like these, okay, they receive a particular meaning in a sentence. And, and bear with me, I will tell you what we mean by that. The, the reference of an reflexive is dependent on something in the sentence. However, the reference of a referential expression like John is not dependent on anything in the sentence. Rather, it is dependent on something in the entire world, okay? which is the following. With one, one more sentence about it. Do you know how many Johns are there in this world? No. Right? Nobody knows. But if, if we end up talking, right, and I, I ask you, uh, uh, did you know what happened to John yesterday? Right? 
this conversation between us and this small extraction of this sentence has a reference to John. Out of all the infinite Johns in the world, the speaker and hearer knows about the reference of the John in this sentence. Right? We vis a vis infinite Johns in the world, we know who we are talking about. Okay? This is why it is called our expressions. In other words, it receives its reference from rest of the world in a given discourse, which for which it does not have to depend on any other component of a sentence. Making sense? It's not, it's not, not a very complicated thing that I am discussing, it is a very simple idea. It simply means these terms have their independent references, they are not dependent on anything else. Clear? So, then all nouns are our expressions? All nouns are our expressions, that is right. No one, no noun is a pronoun, no noun is a reflexive, yes. Absolutely right. If you are talking in general terms, say computers are very smart. Right. So, their computers, computer is not an R, it, it does not need it a. It is R expression, it refers to all the computers of the world. So, it is not, we are not trying to specify a. No, definitely not. The spe being a specific and providing a specific reference, I, I, the example that I gave you was definitely of specific reference. And the reason I was giving that example is because I, I wanted, uh, you are right, I should have said that also. Whether we want to go all the way down to 1 out of infinite or we want to put all infinite together, everything is possible with our expression. This, that will be the feature of an, of, of an R expression. So, when we say computers are smart, are we leaving any computers out? of this thing, this, this with that sentence, the reference of the word computers is to definitely all the computers of the world, right. So, true, absolutely right. Now, now look just, just look at the specificity and breadth of the references that it is providing and that we are capable of providing in a sentence, right. And still, it is independent for its reference, right, all right, clear, uh, reflexives, pronouns and nouns. Now, I have already told you about this thing, I, uh, I wanted to talk about this little later, but it is important to at least refer to this part that a particular module of this, this theory which regulates noun phrase interpretations is called binding theory. Okay? And this, when we, when we go again uh, in details and see, this theory has three, three parts and each part is called, is given a name like principle A, principle B and principle C. Should not be very difficult for you to guess by now that A, B and C ref, would, would finally end up referring to the three sets that I have shown you. That principle A will be talking about reflexives, principle B will be talking about pronouns and principle C will be talking about R expressions. What is it that they have to talk is also very simple, I will show you that. But still the internal mathematics, not, not really in the sense of mathematics, but the internal uh, uh, st structure the, the, each one of these principles depends on how we look at structure and that, that we are going to show you, that, that I will show you. Uh, clear this thing? So, the, again I uh, repeat this thing that the, the, when, when we try to regulate the interpretation of a, of noun phrase in a sentence, this is the part which is called binding theory. And we are, we are going to be talking about the govern, governing distributions of noun phrases in a sentence. Are they related? Are they not related? This is part of binding theory. So, now let us look at them independently again before we look at uh, these principles and X bar theory. Okay? So, 
a reflexive or an or an enougher now does not get its meaning from the open world unlike our expression that i just gave you it depends on something within the sentence and i i want to draw your attention in particular when we say within the sentence we don't mean it in a light sense we mean in the sense of strict definition of a sentence see my, see my point strict definition of a sentence we we don't mean it lightly that anything could be a sentence and now who knows it better than you what a sentence means right sentence is not an ordinary looking thing in a, in in the grammar of natural language sentence has its a specific meaning right okay so john saw himself in the mirror the term himself is a reflexive and john is an r expression or forget about r expression right now john is a noun so himself needs to depend on john in this sentence and not on anything else in the entire world this is why it is called reflexive mary bought herself a sandwich okay the interpretation of the term herself a reflexive and enougher has to depend on mary whoever that mary is in the entire world given the two sentences the grammaticality of the two sentences tells you that the referential referential part is taken care of right this is what is the meaning of a reflexive or an enougher now when we talk about pronouns uh, we have we have talked about it very briefly and we have talked about its description in a in 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 a in any grammar whether we are looking at english grammar or hindi grammar uh, what what have we been told about pronouns it's a term which is stands for a noun i i am not saying that what we what you have been told or what we know about it is wrong that's that's fine but we need to look at it in little bit more details okay in in the following sense this is not this is not complete description of pronoun but this is at least good enough to begin with which is a pronoun is it is really little bit fishy okay it's it's not exactly like reflexives which which is <coughs> reflexives strictly depend on its interpretation within the sentence okay we were looking at our expressions and i'm going to show you that also i'm i'm coming back to pronoun when we look at our expressions there is nothing fishy about it it the the np's like john mary or student professor a pretty girl or computers anything in a as a noun phrase okay may or may not have a ref, reference outside the sentence but within a sentence it receives its interpretation from the whole sets available anywhere in the world get the, get the point another significant point is it cannot be without a reference in a sentence that is a noun phrase must have a reference to something in a sentence clear okay uh, the uh, I, i i don't mean to say more than what i am saying right now uh, but i do want you to understand that uh, the, the 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 things that i am saying some of them may sound pretty obvious but they have meaning for theoretical explanation the the explanatory capacity of the theory depends on these premises even though they sound intuitive okay for example i gave you a, a description of an enougher or a reflexive that it needs to depend on something you may say it's it's a trivial point yeah we see that john likes himself the interpretation of himself depends on john right 
you can say it, it's pretty simple point but that's that is the point the the simplicity of that point lies in the fact that one needs to depend on the other and no matter how obvious it is it has meaning for the explanatory capacity of the theory see understand, understand my point okay so be, please bear with this and it's good that these things are these things may look simple to you and not too complicated all right okay yeah go ahead told that the np should have some reference in the sentence right when you say the sentence like john thinks that he is genius when he he is interpreted as some someone else i'm coming to that then john doesn't have a reference no john still has a reference think about it think john see john thinks he is genius right in this sentence you are saying there are two possibilities one where john and he are related that is the that is when we are talking about the same person in that case he he gets interpretation from john right stop talking about he for a moment and talk about john john still gets independent reference from the world that is to say the interpretation of one prime or one a in the interpretation of one a the reference of he depends on john not the other way around in one b the reference of he comes from somewhere else not from john still the reference of john is not dependent on he get the point the common thing between one a and one b is in both the cases john is independent of he whereas in one he is dependent on john in b he is not dependent on john making sense right and and is, is this is this part clear to everybody our expression and that is the going back to that point that is the precise thing for which i ended up saying there is no fault of these pronouns i ended up saying the story of pronoun seems little bit fishy right and that is the fishiness which gives us ambiguity for example in 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 other words so a pronoun doesn't refer to something in the open world that's the first feature of uh, a pronoun okay it doesn't refer to something in the open world that is it is it's strikingly different from our expressions right when we say uh, john thinks he is he is intelligent right he in interpretation b may not depend on john right but for its interpretation it depends on something which the speaker and the hearer knows right it may depend on uh, peter it may depend on uh, bill it may depend on anybody but it depends on something that the speaker and hearer knows about therefore it is not independent in the world that it it's its reference is limited and known right even when it is not referring to the available np in the sentence for its interpretation we don't have to go too far not the whole world that's the, that's the meaning of the first sentence all right however it may gets its reference from somewhere else and does not need to depend on something within the sentence and that is the that is what your example was talking about and i gave you it may depend on something in the sentence it may not depend on something within the sentence and that is what creates little bit of fishiness and 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 uh, we don't mean it in a sarcastic or or a bad way when we say fishiness we simply say we simply mean that this flexibility gives us ambiguity ambiguity very loosely speaking is a strength of language ambiguity is never a problem and ambiguity is not only the strength of language ambiguity is allowed within the language never never lose the track that we are talking about human mind okay ambiguities are allowed in language because language is one of the finest product of human mind and the strength of human mind 
can still gets, get correct interpretation no matter how ambiguous a sentence is trying to be. Am I, am I making sense? And, and uh, like, like I said, uh, and that is the reason why I said right in up front that we are talking about ambiguity in a very, very uh, non-technical sense because the whole technical dis, uh, description of ambiguity comes in the branch of semantics. It, it can be mathematically coded or decoded. It can be mathematically simulated, the, the ambiguities. Okay? And it's a, it's a very fascinating branch uh, of a study of language on its own. So since we have not been talking about semantics in great details and I have restricted myself to syntax and then I, on the basis of that restrictive description, I told you that now you know what a sentence means and you have seen how long hours we have spent discussing a sentence. Right? We have not discussed meaning in that sense, therefore I am talking about meaning in meaning and semantics in loose sense. However, given the, given the fact that language is product of human mind and uh, human mind uh, the, the, and the capacity of human mind, ambiguity no matter how difficult is a very simple phenomena of human mind. It does not, I mean we need to figure out ambiguity, but our, our mind does not. It, it figures out very categorically. Look at that sentence also, John thinks he is intelligent, right? We are talking about this as a sample, as an example, right? When someone says this kind of sentence in the context, does that person even need to say anything that this time? I mean he, uh, by he, I do not mean John. We do not need to say these things. We know very clearly whether it is it's interpretation A or interpretation B without even getting oblique reference to any one of these things. Okay? Just allow me one more uh, small point. It is not just about the interpretation of sentences. He, the, the capacity of human mind is fascinating, which you already know, I am only referring to them, is, is fascinating in the sense that with sentences, okay, with sentences, it reads things that we do not even say. Have you, you must have heard things like, sometimes people say something, they mean something else. Have you heard this thing? And it happens in day to day life. In other words, such a phenomena is a very normal pattern in society or within people, among people. Human mind has got absolutely no problem figuring those things out. You, you look at uh, political discourse or political context as an example or a very ordinary context of our day to day conversations. Right? I may say many things without saying anything of that sort and then you understand exactly what I say. That is the fascinating capacity and relationship between meaning, language and human mind of which we have not discussed much and when I say we have not discussed much, I mean not in a technical sense to simulate how the underlying mathematics of that sort works. I conclude by saying that part that we have not discussed here, but people have worked on that to, to a great deal. Uh, it is a, it's, it's a time of computer, you are free to Google and look at, look at some of the things. That branch is called semantics and there is another related branch which is called mathematical linguistics. And there, there are books after books written where uh, uh, you look at a book of mathematical linguistics, it looks like geometry or algebra. It will probably not even give you a single sentence like this that you see here on the screen. And it talks with the mathematical uh, notations in the entire paper or in the entire book talking about meanings and the interpretation of meaning. In that context, we are talking about a very small fraction of interpretation. 
All right, give me another couple of minutes before we stop. So uh, uh, I'm glad that you had already asked this question, which I have here. John told Mary that he likes pizza. He is sometimes dependent on John, sometimes independent of John. Mary wondered if she agreed. In this case, the story is a little bit different. And what is the difference of the, in the story? She, as the pronoun, is categorically someone else. Given the nature of the verb wonder, right, the interpretation of she is not dependent on, uh, on Mary. Therefore, this sentence is not ambiguous. Clear? Okay. Same thing is clear from the last sentence. Uh, Mohan concluded that he was crazy. Right? I mean, we don't, if, 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 if he refers to Mohan, then he, need, he doesn't need to conclude that. Right? In, in other words, nobody needs to conclude that that person himself is crazy. Rather, even if you try very hard, you won't be able to conclude that. Right? Because nobody concludes that. that nobody reaches that kind of conclusion. And anyway, I, I, I understand. I, I hope you understand what I mean. You, we have looked at referential expressions. So what's the, what's the problem? In fact, we have been talking about the problem all along. I haven't waited for uh, the problems to give you as part as, as in, in one place. So there are very, very specific configuration in, configurations in a sentence or beyond the sentence in which anaphors, pronouns, and are expressions can or must be used. You understand the meaning of configurations? Specific configurations, right? Which is the, the meaning of a specific configuration is very simple. Uh, uh, did, did, you, did you read something that is in the red? Please, please read that, and then you will understand what I mean by a specific configuration. All right. Now, if we, if if a specific configuration is not clear, here it is. the The use of himself must be within the sentence. Okay. If you use this thing across sentences, then it's not going to work. This is why, and again, I am sorry that I don't have numbers, but we can find things. This is why, the la look at the last sentence. Last sentence is not good because himself is not part of the same IP. Now I, now I start talking about sentences in terms of IP. Even though, if, if we say last sentence has one IP1 and IP2, even though they are related, IP2 is the complement of V of IP1. Clear? IP2 in the last sentence is the complement of V of the IP1. Am I, am I speaking to you? Right? Without the structure, that, that's, that should be clear. Right? So, even that is true, even if that is true, himself is part of IP2, right? And that is from IP2, the, inter the reflexive in IP2 and its, its the, the other thing that it refers back to, that is called antecedent, okay? that technically called antecedent. So reflexives in IP2 and antecedent in IP1 is not allowed. That is what we mean by a specific configuration. The specific, the specific about this configuration is must be within the same IP, two of them must be within the same IP. Their interpretations across IPs are not, not allowed. All right? There is another problem related to the last sentence which and you can see and you can guess and then, then I stop there and we will we'll discuss this further tomorrow. Himself, if you, if, you, if you look at IP in terms of IP1 and IP2, you can see 
it can never be allowed in the specifier position of an IP. The second, in the second IP, it is in the spec of IP. That is a specifier position of the IP2. What is that position for? What is that position for? Spec of IP? Subject. It can, uh, an expression of that sort can never be part of subject, can never be subject as part of a sentence. And, and it's, it, it's no big, uh, big, big discovery. It simply means if something depends on interpretation for its antecedent, then its antecedent, the antecedent by definition means something that precedes it, right? And the moment it becomes the first element in the sentence, where is the antecedent in the sentence, right? Therefore, if there is one position where it can never occur, is the spec IP. In, in ordinary sentence also, some, I, I just gave you that anaphors, reflexives must be within the same sentence, right? Antecedent and reflexive must be within the same sentence. Someone can say himself likes John. Both of them are within the same sentence. Are they okay? No. The only reason for that is spec of IP is not for reflexives because it needs an antecedent. Clear? More and uh, more about it tomorrow. Thank you.